Hi, this is Angie from Canterbury Trails Farm. Today we're going to be recreating a 1930s, 1940s patchwork apron. So this is a common vintage apron that you'll find. This one's been machine sewn and it's got the feed sack fabrics. So this one's probably from the 30s and it's a very common pattern that I see in a lot of vintage aprons. They, they are laid on like a diamond here. And if you look at it this way, you can see that it's really easy to construct because you're just dealing with rows of sort of descending or cascading rows, descending cascading rows of the finished ones are like three, three inches, three inch squares. Um, the pattern that I made is going to be three and a half inch square just to allow for seam allowances. But so it's, it's really a simple layout. But when you turn it this way, it's diamonds and it's more interesting. And it really is a scrappy pattern. It allows you to use up all those neat little odds and end bits. So I got this in a lot of a bunch of other vintage aprons. And I thought, you know, that is so cute. I have a bunch of vin actual vintage fabric that I've had for years. Just little bits that I've saved from this project and that project. And it's going to be perfect for this. Before we get started on this, I wanted to show you a few things that I have acquired. You know that I'm constantly looking for neat little vintage linens and I, we might I have I've been looking all over this is a little tablecloth and I use them like uh, turned on a diamond on top of my regular tablecloth as a sort of a topper just for expertness in my kitchen I've been looking all over for this pattern this transfer pattern it looks to me like a Vogart embroidery transfer but I can't find this exact one I did find one similar to it and there is a chance that the seamstress may have altered the pattern to fit her own needs. If I can't find it anywhere then I will recreate this pattern and we might attempt at making some matching placemats or maybe the topper itself. But it's really cute. It's small. It's probably about 30 inch, 6 inches square. It's not a real big one. It's sort of like a bridge tablecloth size is what they always said. But this one's from the 30s. It has the bead um, sack fabric and has some lovely French knots, different embroidery. So that was really cute. Wanted to show you that. And then I got these other, let me pick this up here. I got this awesome, these were actual vintage toweling, huck toweling, that were never used. And I've got, this one's a shorter piece, and then I got a really long piece that I'm going to cut. I think I'm going to cut that into two towels, and this one I think will make about four towels, and I'm going to have to hem it all. It's raw. It was pretty soiled when I got it, but I washed it up, and it washed up good. I'm really excited about that, so I'm going to make some towels out of that. I'm not going to embroidery on this because it has all these stripes and stuff going on. So The other thing is, I'm not exactly sure what order all my videos are going to be or uh, are going to be appearing in. Sometimes I, I make a bunch of videos, and then I pick. I try to do a sewing video and I try to do a cooking video and then Thursday is usually you know a whatever if I have um, homestead videos and I try to put those in there but um, I always try to do a sewing and some sort of cooking video or herbs or something involving garden or food or medicinal herbs. I've done um, some videos on my cozy TV project corner that I'm doing and we've talked about my cats are just loving this. So the stuff I'm making and all of my materials have finally arrived. I had ordered some other pieces in the other video that I'm not sure <laughs> if it's aired before this one or not so this might be you might have to go catch whichever one it comes in to get the whole project but I had ordered some other pieces here because I didn't really have any reds. Dug out, uh, this uh, is a quilt but I bought it for the fabric. It's not quilted, it's tied so I can take it apart and this fabric is awesome. I had this I dug out. It used to be a pillow on my daughter's bed but a pillow of sham that I had made but I, I just love it so much I might redo it into a big pillow to go with my cozy corner. So I've got this white, nice white plush Chanel I've got this really cute, this was just a piece, heart, so I might make another separate like heart pillow to go with the everything. It's just really cute. And then these were just two pieces of various reds. There's a popcorn Chanel and then just the regular Chanel here. In addition to all my fabrics that we talked about in the other video, how I was going to do slip cover out of this cutter sunbonnet Sioux pattern. 
and then I'm going to do the real full nice ruffle with one of these red calicos and I think I'm going to do the arms Chanel and then I'm going to cover the the pillows with Chanel on one side and some sort of fabric or quilt square on the other side and then the back is going to be a calico and then we talked about the privacy screen that I'm also going to be padding and covering that in one of these red calicos. So I have a whole bunch of awesome things to work from. The cats have approved everything. Everyone has been sort of fighting. There's already some cat hair on here and puddings on here. Everybody's just sort of fighting over who gets to sleep on this. At one point, one cat was on top and one cat was burled under it. So everyone loves it. So that makes me know it's going to be a really cozy slip cover when I get done with this whole corner. I got my combination uh, 1949 Magnavox TV phonograph or record player and radio in a wood console that we're going to pick up this weekend. I am so excited about restoring that and we talked about how I'm going to rig that up so I can watch my 1930s movies. I've been doing so many loom knitting videos that I really have gotten away from more of my sewing. Crafty holiday sort of based loom knitting projects and I have all these other projects piling up. But these are very common and you'll find those a lot if you really start digging. Sometimes you have to do some repair because some of, a lot of those were hand pieced because they were scrap projects. What I've got, I've got four piles here. To, this is going to be, I think I'm going to do two. I thought I, uh, maybe three. We'll see how, what my squares end up. But I picked out, these are true vintage fabrics. And I have these, I picked up my, I tried to pick out the small pieces that I've just been saving over the years. I mean, literally some of these I've had for over a decade. Um, they're just little pieces waiting for a quilting type project. And this is going to be perfect. I think this one's already cut. Yep, just perfect. So, and then I have some solids and these are all vintage except for this one white piece. That's, that's not vintage. These are all vintage solids. This is actually the, the part of the feed sack that doesn't have the cool printing on it. <laughs> so I have a piece of that. Uh, it's always good to put some solids in with the prints. Then I have a pile that I thought I'd incorporate some of this that just has their, their scraps of vintage fabrics that have some needlework on them. They're just pieces that I save for these kind of purposes. And most of these are left over from some other project. So I have these and I thought I'll use some of those and incorporate some of the embroidery, it'd be pretty. And then I have the other pile of scraps I have is actually Aunt Grace, and I'm trying to think of some of the other, maybe there I have it on here. Everything from the kitchen sink, that was RJR Fabrics. Everything but the kitchen sink, I'm sorry. Um, this one I already have the salvages, salvages cut. A few years back there was a big to do about the reproduction 1930s fabrics which were awesome and I was in a bunch of fabric clubs where you got a series of quarter, of fat quarters. Anyway so these are because why I love them so much because you know I sew for dolls and most of the prints are small prints. That one isn't that's not too scale but something like this would be too scale that I could use for a small doll. So these are little little pieces that I love fabric so much I really have a hard time throwing away my bits and pieces but I dug out all my bits and pieces to use I'm going to try to use the actual vintage pieces first Get yourself a nice solid piece of cardboard cut yourself a three and a half inch square pattern piece and you're going to need 43 of three and a half inch square pattern pieces out, cut out of fabric so you'll need 43 of those and two of those will be a uh, two pockets so those are included in your in your count then you're going to need a 56 by 2 inch long strip to use as the ties and the waistband uh, the one that I, the apron that I have might have been made for a child and it might have been made for a skinny woman but the Tie, the whole thing was only 46 inches and I could tie it behind me but I like to tie mine around tie them behind me and then tie them around and tie it in front it's just a thing I like to do I can tighten it better that way or I like to do a big bow well this didn't give me ample room to do a big bow I could tie a small ball I, but so I just extended the this, this ties by 10 inches and made it 56 inches 56 by 2 inch and you need one strip and I'm going to use this 
I have this vintage fabric. This is like from the 40s or the 50s. I think it's more 50s, maybe early 60s by the color. That turquoise was real popular in the 50s and the early 60s. I cut my pieces probably for two or three aprons. And then when we come back, uh, we will be ready to sew the apron together. I have this great old um, Sears Roebuck calendar from fall and winter 1934. Originally got it because Shirley Temple came out. The doll came out in 1934. And when I found this, it was like wrapped in plastic, so I couldn't open it up. But it was really in really nice condition, and so I went ahead and gave it. The doll was not in the catalog. I, so that's why I bought this catalog. I work with a lot of vintage materials like I do. It's, it's invaluable for dating fashions and stuff like that. And I, so I tend to, because I sew for antique dolls from about 1900 to about, about 1950, but I prefer to stay in the 20s to 40s. I sew for some, you know, those dolls. I like to collect the old catalogs. I have this awesome Hirschner needlework catalog that I keep this in plastic. But you can see it's the fall winter 28-29 catalog. And I just got my Hirschner catalog for Christmas yesterday. So, I mean, it's still going. But they'll usually have inserts of varying colors. The fabric... find the fabric insert. Fabric one is usually color. Because they wanted you to buy color. And this is also great for dating bead sack fabrics so if you ever come if you do any a lot of sewing with vintage fabrics these catalogs are the greatest thing for finding your actual to see the date that the fabrics came out and, but the reason why I pulled this one out is because we're working on this patchwork apron from the 30s and the 40s I thought maybe we could find one pre-made um, available for purchase but the only apron they have in here, I also use a lot of the baby fashions too, that's why I have those more. The only thing I could find was like a whole body apron. Half aprons, there were no half aprons at all in the catalog. And I'm assuming that's because most women didn't need a pattern. If you Google for vintage patchwork apron pattern or vintage sewing pattern apron patchwork, whatever combination of the words you want to put together, you're going to come up with a lot of things from the 1970s. You come up with patchwork maxi skirts, patchwork purses, the hobo style, lots of patchwork everything from the 70s. Through vintage 40s, 30s, 20s patterns for skirts and they did some dresses in the Depression era just out of necessity and aprons. You're not going to find a lot of patterns. You may find garments being resold on eBay and Etsy and all those places that are vintage, but you're going to have a really difficult time finding the patterns. I do have a picture, and I'll put it up, of one skirt that I found, but I believe it's more from the 50s, and it was a pattern for it. And I think the reason why there aren't that many patterns is because women just didn't need them. Sewing was a vital part of everyday life up until probably the end of the war, World War II, when everyone came back and then we had the big industrial boom and we had the baby boom and everything and it was this life of, no, I don't want to say excess, but after the war it was bettered. Rationing was canceled in America. It continued on in quite some time in England. But so there were um, a lot of ready-made clothes being made and bought more than usual in, up in the decades prior to that. So women just grew up sewing. You learned how to sew as a child. It was just expected that you were going to probably sew the majority of your children's clothes, except for maybe a fancy dress or something. Um, in the old catalogs, what you primarily see, the biggest section, is the men's section. I think that's because men's clothes and men are harder to sell for because of the tailoring and because, well, just because if they were going off to work, they needed, you know, certain suits and it just a more detailed sewing than what generally you did for women who stayed at home, a house dress of some sort, aprons and children's clothes. So I think women did most of the sewing for themselves and their children. And then when they had to buy something ready made, it was some kind of durable denim wear or something for the man. So that's why you often see in these older catalogs, a bigger section for the men, which I think it's sort of reversed now, which is sort of unusual. 
Because women do the most of the shopping, I think. All that to say, you're not going to find a lot of patterns out there. So when I did all that, I thought, you know, I had this really cute apron, and I thought, let's let's make this apron. And I was wanting to maybe refer you to a vintage pattern if you need a pattern. But I couldn't find one at all. So, because I think what happened was women saw something they liked of their friends, and they looked at it. This is what I do. And I learned how to do this out of half to -ness if that's a word, because I didn't have the money. I grew up, we didn't have money, and when I was first teaching, I didn't have money. And I can look at something, and I think this comes from, and I think women used to be able to do this more than they can today. And it comes from because I started sewing at a very early age. My mother taught me, you know, everything she knew. I learned everything I could from the elderly ladies in the church. If there wasn't, you know, could always find somebody that knew how to do something. I think most women just looked at it and if they saw something that a friend had and they liked it, they studied it, the friend probably said, sure, here, look at it. They examine, they do what I do when I go to antique stores. I turn something over, I see how it's constructed, you know, I examine, you know, the different parts of it. I break it down into parts in my head and then I recreate it. And I figured out this apron. It's very simple. And this is the sort of the pattern that you see a lot of for sale on, vin on Etsy and eBay and places that you're seeing vintage patchwork aprons. It's this zigzag edge and it's just simple and it has, sometimes it has pockets sometimes it doesn't and this they've just actually used the same squares that they were using to make the skirt in the pockets turn it on sort of like a straight so you're not doing you know it, like say it's up and down I don't know how to describe that you're not you know, when we hang it when it's we're wearing it it's gonna be on diagonal so it's gonna be like diamonds but if you turn it so everything's a straight row you can really sort of see how it's constructed and we just have these rows you have seven rows of fabric and a waistband is what we've got. So let me go down the rows. So the first row, you're going to have five squares. Your second row, you're going to have six squares. Your third row, you'll have seven squares. Your fourth row, you'll also have seven squares. Your fifth, you'll have six squares. Your sixth row, you'll have six squares again. And your seventh row, you will have four squares. Now on the ends of some of these they'll be encapsulated inside your waistband. But that's what you have. Seven rows and that should be 43 um, squares I think. Not a complicated pattern. Two of these will be saved for the pockets and you're going to need some kind of bias tape. And the complete and utter chaos that my sewing room is today. So everything's sort of a mess and I've got a bunch of different projects going on that we're going to be getting to and as we get to them I can clean some of this mess out. <laughs> I think what I did I got ahead of myself with all my projects. I'm going to sew my, like I said I cut my strip into t two sections because that's just what I had as far as length. So I'm just going to sew it so it's one piece. Do these just in the order of rows and so our first row we're just going to do five five a row of five squares row one. Next row, two, row two, going to be a row of six. Okay, so that's row number two has six pieces. All right, row number three is going to have seven pieces. Alright, our fourth row is also going to have seven pieces to it. Let's double 
five. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. We're on row five, and we're going to be doing six pieces. Okay, row five, six pieces. Yeah, we're on row six. I think I said row five. Row six, we did six pieces. Before we start joining everything together, let's look. So row one through three, you're going to stagger like steps. The end. So it'll be three rows staggered like steps. And then row four through seven, you'll line a lined up with row three. So when you get to row, you're going to have step, 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 and then all of them will be lined up to the end at that point because remember we're going to turn it on a diagonal. Okay, row six, lining up. Let me see, we had the stair set one, two, three, and then we've been lining these up. Final row. Okay, let me go. I'm also going to turn the edges under where they're going to be sewn. Iron those on the pockets just to make it easier to sew the pockets on. These pockets are going to be small because remember we're using the same block size that we were using for the apron. So our waistband is going to go up here along the top. That's going to be our top. And I'm just ironing this, this down so we can see where the top is when we're working. Especially for you on the camera because I know it can get confusing watching everything here. So I'm going to shove those edges in there. Now there are more than one ways to put bias tape on, especially if you're using like a single. You can sew on one side and then uh, fold it over so you have like one invisible seam that was tucked in. But for this apron, um, the easiest thing is just going to be doing what I'm doing and just backing. We're just going to have one seam and we're just putting the um, edge right into that bias. Now when I get to the corner here, in order, I'm just going to sort of open it up, move it up a little bit, and fold it so then I have a mitered corner. So you keep that nice point at the end of your zigzag. All right, now I'm going to deal with the waistband for a second. We also need to put some piece of bias tape on each of the pockets. First, let's fold it in half. So I just need to choose a place to start. I think I'm going to start up here at this top. Piece of bias taped here. 
Went ahead and pinned it on. I forgot. I gotta fill the bias tape here. We have the old one that we were copying, and we have the new one that we copied. They did the that on invisible on one side and then flip it over. This one I just slipped it right in the look pockets. There's the other pockets. They used matching ones, but I liked mixing it up. And my one pocket is the same as my waistband. And there's a couple. I think there's a. Is there? Oh yeah, there's at least one square. Oh, there's two squares from the, the waistband fabric in there, so it ties it all together. But I did use the got to use my a lot of the vintage embroidery pieces that I had saved uh, out of various projects, and all of the fabrics were vintage fabrics, just like um, if it had been made vintage. So has a similar look to it and we used vintage fabric so you could use whatever fabrics I have a mixture of reproductions and vintage and the other one but this one I wanted to do all these vintage squares so those are our two aprons that we recreated the 1930 1940s patchwork aprons and that was a fun little project it didn't take too long probably took longer to cut out all the blocks than it did to put them all together so this has been Angie from Canterbury Charles Farm and today we've cre recreated a 1930s 1940 patchwork half apron. So I hope this was a fun project. See you next time.